Today we are going to talk about capacitors and there is a lot to talk about because there are also some special parameters, important parameters, and many engineers, they forget about these parameters and they can think they are placing, I don't know, 100 microfarad capacitor on a board, but in reality it may be only, I don't know, 20 microfarads or 10 microfarad. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so why is this? Well, the material systems themselves make all of the difference in terms of the capacitor performance. Um, it might be stability with temperature, with voltage, with time. And I could show a, a, a some comparisons and some information that might bring this all into light. And uh, maybe the first parameter that's very easy to get burned by is the DC bias effects on a ceramic capacitor. So as you said, we might want to put in 10 microfarads into a circuit. And in fact, we find that it's nowhere near that based upon our circuit performance. Well, um, many engineers have not taken into account the massive amount of capacitance drop that could be occurring because of the DC bias on the part. Okay, and then I this have, graph on I'm the, sorry for yes. interrupting. I, I will always, uh, you know, use my hands when I would like to interrupt you. Got it. Uh, because many people complain like, please don't interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So I just will raise my hand. And uh, so first I think we should say what DC bias means. Okay, good idea. Okay, yeah, so DC bias is actually when we when we purchase a capacitor, we say we want maybe 10 microfarads by choosing a catalog. But when we put it in circuit and apply the voltage to it, maybe we're working at a 5 volt circuit, maybe 3 volt, 12 volt. Whenever we apply that DC bias, the capacitance value drops in the case of ceramic capacitors. Uh, by the way, that in itself is a very big advantage of tantalum capacitors. They do not have a, B a DC bias effect. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, and, and tantalum has a lot to offer and tantalum and tantalum polymers are, are getting a lot uh, more um, press and a lot more applicable to circuitry. In fact, the inductance of any capacitor really matters, but jumping back onto the ceramic capacitor world, um, this graph on the left shows that when we apply that DC bias on the capacitor, its value will drop potentially very dramatically um, and down to maybe 90%, 80%, something like that. And to make it even more concerning, that amount of drop will vary by the manufacturer that you purchase from. And that's what's shown on the right. So this is a, a a stability factor within ceramic capacitors that is very easy uh, to have a problem. And I think engineers should pay close attention to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just would like to clarify. The, the graph on the left, it means if uh, the capacitor what we choose for our circuit has exactly this graph. And uh, for example, we are creating uh, let's say power supply for 10 volts, then uh, uh, when we buy 10 microfarad capacitor and we connect it to these 10 volts on the output, basically the capacitor is going to be only 60% or minus 60, oh, okay, minus. Yeah. So it's going to be minus. only 40% of uh, the 10 microfarads, so four microfarads, correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, okay. we have to be careful because this graph varies by the dielectric type okay, uh, and it also varies by the manufacturer. So okay. some ceramics are quite stable, like the CLG class of dielectrics. Some are inherently unstable with bias voltage. It doesn't mean that they're bad, but we have to take into account that bias voltage effect. That's like an X5R maybe. Okay, now I would like to mention, I think there is also something called AC bias voltage or something like this. Yes, that's right. So we've got the same situation here. Um, and this might be ripple. This might be low level ripple on a, uh, you know, on, a, on a, a capacitor. And you could see that there's some additional change in the, uh, 
in the characteristics of the calf. Right. Of course, it's not as large, so therefore it's not perhaps as, as notable in your calculations. But sure, this is another another problem why your calf value could be low. Okay. And you already mentioned uh, there are differences between materials. So I really would like to talk about this because uh, when you search for uh, standard ceramic capacitors, you have always this X5R and Y5V or X7R. What are the differences? Which one we should use? All right. I'll give you a quick, um, a quick example of, of the dielectrics. Um, what we're seeing here are some common dielectric types used. Now, this is on the left-hand side, and you can see the underneath the type header, there's the certain dielectric um, nomenclature. Then there's the class, the operating temperature range, and the stability, and we show a graph on the right. So this is just meant to say, hey, here's common dielectrics that you might be using. Now, with time, this, this also changes. It gets bigger. We'll go to the next page, and this actually shows what how do we call out those dielectrics? We saw a three alpha, a three digit alphanumeric code. The first character, uh, it talks about the low temperature, that X, the Y, or Z mm -hmm. gives us the low temperature. The second parameter, the second characteristic gives us the high temperature characteristic. So that's your low temp operating range, your high temp operating range. And then what we'll have in the third is essentially our stability, the capacitance stability. I, I was I, I I really never was looking for this information. I always thought it's just some kind of mark for material. I didn't know you can actually yeah. very easily decode what this means. But this is so useful. <laughs> yes, it really is. Um, I, I'll have to say that EPCI, uh, European Passive Component Institute, um, has a couple of good summarizing charts on this. Um, but yeah, this is basically the same thing. Now, this, <clears throat> this is interesting because you'll see that there's two different types of, well, there's many types of ceramics. Um, there's class one, two, and three. So if we were to talk about, generally speaking, where would you use these? So on a ceramic capacitor, class one is the highest stability part. Uh, that might be a resonance circuit. Yep. I have a question. How do you know what class your capacitor is? Uh, that's based upon the dielectric type, um, the loss characteristics of the, of the dielectric type. And um, it's all based on, upon formulations. And there's uh, a few charts later on. We'll, we'll talk about uh, class one porcelains and, and then uh, and some others could be class one and then some of the other general purpose X7R, X5R, that's the class. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's go back to these classes. Yeah, so um, yeah, class one is going to be your, your highest stability parts. That might be um, uh, resonant circuits, timing, things like that, class two. Now, this is where we start getting into the volumetric uh, efficiency um, hope, where we'd like to have very large amounts of, of capacitance in a small package, and the dielectrics get more aggressive in terms of the K factor. K factor is how um, how, how much essentially uh, capacitance we could throw into that given volume. Mm -hmm. So class two is, is good for smoothing and bypass, coupling, decoupling, things like that. And then uh, we get into other, other dielectric classes, which uh, th they certainly occur, but they're not as common as class one and two. Now, I could give you a bit more information uh, on class one and two, just because by knowing this, we're covered very, um, statistically, we're covered for a very large amount of the applications. Okay. Now, um, so on, on the right-hand side, you're going to see the temperature uh, stability of this part, and uh, that's based upon uh, the low temp, the high temp, and, and what happens to the capacitance in between those uh, temperature ranges. And then we'll look at capacitance versus frequency. Um, that is some of the uh, implicit characteristics of the uh, dielectric. But basically, class one, that's our tight tolerance stuff. You might see a class one padding a, a crystal, maybe the 10 or 22 picofarad parts on a crystal. You might see it in a resonant charger, a wireless charger. Um, 
that type of, of application. Basically, there are no, essentially no DC bias effects. There's very little temperature effects. There's very little um, aging effects. So that's kind of important. Now, class two is where we get into some instability, but I would like to stress that instability isn't necessarily a problem mm -hmm. um, because these devices can provide exceptionally large amounts of capacitance in small packages. So we need that. And um, basically we get this better volumetric efficiency, but that's at the, the cost of the stability of the part. Now, stability might mean it's, it's temperature stability. It might mean it's aging stability or things like that. We'll look at that graph. Uh, remember on the class one parts, essentially we saw that graph centered around zero. Well, on class two, we'll see that we have some potential instability at the low end and at, at the high end. Mm -hmm. So again, that's not a problem, but it's something that we have to live with. Now on the bottom right, we could show you there's that decoder key. Of, so that kind of perhaps helps you a little bit more. Interestingly enough, with gallium nitride uh, and silicon carbide, some of the three, five compounds, there's a general request and maybe interest in getting into higher temperature ceramics. So now it's actually common to some extent to get to 150 C. Certainly in our vehicles, there's a lot of 150 C electronics in oil exploration and, and some things like there, there's 200. I've seen some examples where we're we're seeing capacitors specified at 150 in the power conversion world. Mm -hmm. I have um, a question. So that, yeah. So uh, normally when you buy capacitors, do they say if it's class one or class two, or you can somehow figure it out, or you need to figure it out from this uh, uh, marking or? Yeah, typically it there is a code in the part number and in, in that code, the, the manufacturer would say this is a NPO or X7R. And from that, and from that data sheet, you can see if it's class one or class two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we said before, that's important. It affects this DC bias. It affects the AC bias. But let's look at aging. Yeah. That, that so, was my next question, actually. I was very curious. What does it mean? Yeah. Well, you know, aging, I, I collect uh, some older radios and sometimes my circuits are actually going to go out of tolerance. Uh, interestingly enough, it happens more because of the timing devices, but, but um, aging is a problem in the, in the ceramic world as well. And this is a big deal. So if we look at, at decades of time, you'll see that essentially the class one, that CLG NPO class part, uh, that's the class one, right? It has no, no aging. Well, it says as soon as we get into the you know X7R, X5R, that's starting to get significant, 2% uh, per decade of time. And you can see the, the cumulative effect of, of that in this graph. Now this, we have to stress, this is in addition to that DC bias. So mm -hmm. as you said, saw that, that we could be down maybe 80%. Now add 2%, additional degradation for that period of time. And then we could look at the temperature effects. And what we're seeing here is uh, the temperature curve. Uh, so, but, and of course this also shows bias effects and, and such, but generally speaking, you can see quite a bit of temperature instability. And that's where in that dielectric code, the one that said in X7R, we might have that plus or minus 15% variation over temperature, that all adds up. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a great excerpt from EPCI. And what they show is the actual capacitance, mm -hmm. which you might have purchased, maybe that 10 mic. Well, it's going to drop very significantly in circuit and you could end up with very unpleasant surprises. Okay, I have a question. So uh, is there some kind of relationship uh, between these characteristics and, uh, and uh, voltage of the capacitor, what do you really need or what do you buy? Because for example, sometimes you need five volt capacitor, but the people recommend to buy a capacitor for 25 volts because 
it may have bad characteristics rather than buying yeah. I don't know six point three volt capacitor. Yeah, that that's true. Uh, that that <laughs> generally speaking, that helps you in terms of the bias characteristics, at least to some extent. There's also some reliability impacts upon that, and um, there's even some transient response um, advantages of that. Um, one of the trends uh, in the world of integration capacitors, the ones that are used not to clamp a transient voltage, but to actually um, um, reduce it to, uh, to, to charge up and release that charge slowly so we don't have a massive spike blowing out a gate. So one of the trends of that design um, or that aspect of design is to buy the, the highest amount of capacitance or, or excuse me, the highest amount of voltage that you could fit. And usually those have a higher breakdown voltage. Um, now there is a new option if engineers are trying to put, oh, maybe a nanofarad or 470 picofarads or 100 puff on a signal line, maybe like on a connector and maybe from one board to the next. So when you're dealing with that scenario, you're using cap to just knock down any possible uh, incoming transients. Uh, there's something called an ESD safe capacitor and those are actually pulse rated capacitors. So I kind of, I kind of sidestepped your question. Yes. Using a higher voltage part will help you on DC bias to some extent. Uh, but there's also a de design philosophy if you're trying to do some uh, integration, some uh, ESD attenuation, things like that, that's where uh, that comes into play as well. Of course, that new series of parts, the ESD safe parts, are attractive because then you have a, a small case size which can withstand a higher transient voltage. Usually, larger voltages translate into larger uh, case sizes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm. I heard about these uh, these ceramic capacitors to sometimes uh, break. So can we yes. talk about this? I think you made a video with uh, Dave Jones about uh, these kind of problems. Or yeah, there 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 is uh, some some concerns about ceramic capacitors, and in the world of the automotive and in the aerospace world, they were the ones that forced the manufacturers to, to create a solution. And the standard test is if we mounted a capacitor on a printed circuit board, and if we supported that board across the 90 millimeter span, what amount of deflection could we get by pushing that board and bending it? So this is a automotive AECQ 200 test. That's the automotive test requirements to become qualified. Uh, they're saying they want a minimum deflection of, of a couple of millimeters on FR4 board. Well, this is a really good graph here. Now, a series of graphs. This shows various case sizes, the 0805 over here, the 0603 here, 1206 here, 1210. And it shows the different dielectrics, the NPO, the class one, the X7R class two, then something X7R with flexi term. Mm -hmm. Well. This is good because if you're in an environment where we're manufacturing something and you're noticing that you're getting cracks, cracks might come back as a field failure for low insulation resistance. Your capacitor might not be acting as, as a capacitor. It might act as a 1 or 10 megohm resistor. Um, so at any rate, this shows by case size and by dielectric, the amount of deflection that a standard NPO or a standard X7R should be able to uh, withstand in normal applications. Of course, this isn't a guarantee, but it's a good yardstick, right? Then there's this thing called flexi term, and using the same X7R dielectric, we show the best case that you could ever expect from a standard 0603 X7R six millimeters. Well, we show that the that's greatly eclipsed, suddenly we can withstand these crazy amounts of deflection that in fact, they're so uh, large, you'd actually break the other components on the printed circuit board. Mm -hmm. So flexible termination is a tremendous way to get around both vibration or board flexure 
or even thermal cycling on the board yeah. where it's getting hot and cold. Let's, let's and go, here's let's, how this yeah, thing... Let's go back. I have some questions. Yeah. So here I would like to uh, just uh, be sure higher means better, okay? It means yeah. like 10 millimeters, it means we could bend the PCB by 10 millimeters and it was still working. Okay. Yes, that's right. Now, other parts might not work yeah, on that. I I ICs mean. might pop, but this and, and that amount of safety actually translates into some other degrees of confidence on reliability, I, uh, especially. I still have a yeah. question. I still have a question. Sorry. Uh, so uh, what's the difference between the last one and uh, the last X7R Flexi term and the standard X7R? Got it. What happens there is um, physically and visually, you could not look at the parts and tell that they're different. I'll show this example of what we add. Um, if we were to look at a ceramic capacitor, and here we've taken a standard part uh, on the top and a flexible termination part on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing a failure mode. In this, we see a crack. You see that little line? Usually a flex crack initiates at the metal to ceramic interface, and it propagates up the height of that capacitor, sort of in relationship to the height of the solder fillet. And that's kind of shown over here in this example. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a real problem because we have one active that is in that crack zone, another active in the crack zone, so we are going to definitely have low insulation problems there. That's a latent failure. That's a disaster. Uh, our best hope is to find that at outgoing test, but most likely it's not going to be found because the moisture isn't going to get in there and cause that reduction in resistance and, until some time. So to get around that, you see, there's no compliance between this board and the actual ceramic itself. The ceramic acts like a brick. Now, what we've done here, we've added this blue layer and that blue layer is an added material. It's a conductive epoxy, but it's a very specialized one. And it's allowed to take some of that compression mm -hmm. and some of that tension. And rather than get a crack like this, we get a deformation in the termination. Mm -hmm. But that's irrelevant. That has no bearing or impact upon the electricals because this uh, effect, which is nothing more than metal slightly deforming, uh, it has no stress that's impaired it on the part. So FlexiTerm uh, takes that normal ceramic and copper interface, uh, that's the copper termination. Upon that, we build this conductive epoxy, then you'll have a nickel barrier, then you'll have maybe tin, uh, and allows that to actually become the shock absorber. And in the standard parts, you have copper and then nickel, that barrier layer, and then you have your final tin uh, outer finish. So you couldn't tell the difference of these, you know, visually, but uh, you can in terms of when we cut them apart, if you know what you're looking for, if you do some uh, spectrographic analysis and such, you could see the addition of that. Now, one thing that should possibly concern you is conductive epoxy. Um, and what we have to say here is not everyone's conductive epoxy that's used on flexible terminations is the same. What we want to do is we want to have a conductive epoxy which does not add a lot of resistance or any resistance to that component. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's uh, the, the case for our uh, particular material system. There is no added ESR through that uh, flexible termination through the conductive epoxy. But please be careful because some um, conductive epoxies that are used in the industry can have an impact. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a big problem. And uh, out, output ripple voltage, things like that, that's that's a big negative having a higher ESR part. So, so like, yes. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I will think well, flexible that. termination solves a lot of problems out there. Um, and we're looking only at this, um, this, this flexure test, but we could show that um, with data, and I don't think I have the data in front of me, but I could easily get it, that, uh, that you could triple the amount of thermal cycles that would occur 
um, in a component without having problems. Okay, so I have a question. When we are talking about these connections and leads, how is it with inductance? Because I yes. think inductance is super important. So let's have a look what what kind of yes. influence and what influences the inductance of the capacitor. Yeah, it's horribly it's horribly important to look at inductance of the capacitors. And <clears throat> in fact, I've got a few slides um, that that talk about what are trends within the ceramic capacitor world and. The big one is, or one of the big ones is we have to drop inductance, we have to control inductance, we have to be aware of it, right? So adding flexible termination does not impact the inductance of the part. Now, in many cases, in earlier years, automotive manufacturers would have two standard ceramic capacitors in series. So they'd have two of these types of parts in series and they'd be at 90 degrees on the printed circuit board, thinking that if, if the board bent one direction, only one part would shed, would fail. If it if, and if the other component was in series, you would not have a, a dead short to ground. And that was important in in things like terminal thirty, the power at all times, things like that. Well, the problem with two components in series at ninety degrees, we're taking up a lot of board space, and that and the two components inductance adds. So you could, using a single flexi term component could actually drop the inductance of the solution and circuit, where you no longer need two of these parts in series with printed circuit board traces and lands and the associated inductance with that. And you'd only have one of these parts. So though the cap inductance is the same, the solution could be an overall lower inductance with this. Also, we could argue that the ESR would be lower with that single flexible termination part. And there is data for both those cases that we could show and uh, I could send to you should be interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, but now I mean like uh, also inductance in other cases, not just for this flex uh, flexi term, uh, but also like, I don't know, uh, size of the capacitors or Yes. type of the capacitors or or maybe I, I seen you have there's some capacitors in parallel or yes. and I and we would like to talk about this uh, again I would like to point out this is for example in, inductance is one of the important uh, things for power delivery that's why we would like to have very low inductance for capacitors because it helps with power delivery yes that's true um, maybe I could start at, at the beginning, the um, the big trends in ceramics, if that's okay. okay. And um, it's it's what you're saying is exactly true. What we have to worry about is the inductance of the part. In fact, now one of the big uh, considerations I'm hearing from designers are that ceramic, well, that many capacitor types, not only ceramics their performance has a limiting effect on how efficient the semiconductor could be. I believe that. And I think as time goes on, we're going to find that semiconductors are so advanced, it's the passives that are starting to limit them. So here's some snapshots of, of typical ceramic capacitors. Um, one that might not be as well known as the stacked part. They could be stacked horizontally. They could be stacked vertically relative to the board. Then there's other things that have terminations in the center. Well, let me show the, the trends in ceramics. So one of the first ones is that the, the desire is to have much more capacitance in a small case size. And what we're seeing here, it's a cross section of a ceramic capacitor. Uh, this light part, this is the termination mm -hmm. on this end and then on this end. Then this is the ceramic itself. And then this lighter area, we'll blow that up and we'll show that this happens to be the electrode. The electrode is nickel. Then the darker area, that's a uh, barium titanate. Essentially that's the ceramic dielectric. So this, <clears throat> this, is, this is nothing more than the same cover material, the same dark ceramic up here, but there's so many electrodes that actually affects the color that we perceive mm -hmm. in this area. So this, this, the dielectric thickness, this ceramic thickness could be a hundredth of a human hair. 
and there might be 500 layers in this 0402 cap. Now, that's a big trend, right? We want higher capacitance per unit volume, that's high CV. Now, to get to high CV, we have to have the stacking capability to put very accurately put down uh, electrode and the dielectric mm -hmm. without causing direct shorts. We have to have a stable dielectric. And so you need manufacturing and you need materials to line up. When that lines up, you could also build miniature parts. And this is a really neat graph because this shows how and what the impact of, of smaller parts are. I used to think that an 0105 was a small part and it's small, but it's not the smallest part. And these 08004s are incredibly small. In fact, Robert, I'll send you some and they're they're well smaller than a grain of salt. You can't see these I guess things. this is dust. <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable, right? So, but, and it's amazing to think that people are processing these. Amazing to think that we could process these, I would right? say machine process. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So, you know, the big deal is though, look at the, the weight reduction that we're getting relative to an 0805. And then looking at the look at that mounting area reduction. So that's really exceptionally important that um, we could get these high amounts of capacitance in small packages. Hey, and by the way, <clears throat> in 08004, uh, 08004, that might be 0.1 in there. So that's that's still sizable capacitance in these ultra miniature parts. Well, when we go to these parts, if we were using just to look at the impact of what does this mean? Maybe on a decoupling corral, um, these capacitors around a FPGA or whatever. Let's say we're using 100.06.03s. And if we go to an 0402, we could either save 54% of the board space by going to the 0402. Or if we want to use the same board space, that same board area, we could we could over double the amount of capacitance. We could, rather than put 100.06.03s, we'll put 217.04.02s. And then if we take it another step further, if we go to an 0201, we could reduce that board space by 79%. That's, that's incredible, right? And then if we want to use that same board area, we could put nearly 500.0201s on that, on that board area. So that's trend two, right? Trend one was high CV, high cap, and in a, in a particular case size, trend two is putting more cap in that in that uh, smaller case size. Um, now we get to inductance, and this is really exceptionally important, especially as IC speeds just accelerate madly. Now, if we look at these components, I put down the picture. And then I put the electrode orientation mm -hmm. relative to the termination. So the termination here would correspond to this edge. The termination here corresponds to this edge. Mm -hmm. That's a standard part. We're just going back to an 805. I consider now an 0805 a very big part. Um, that's 700 picohenries of inductance, body inductance on that ceramic cap. Now, of course, that impacts the resonant frequency of that capacitor, its usable frequency range. So we want to drive that inductance lower. Now, if we have a reverse geometry part, that could be considered low inductance. With a so, reverse geometry part... So reverse, it means uh, now we are... Uh, the the contacts are on the longer edge contacts uh, before edge. they were on the shorter edge. Okay. Yep. Yes, yeah, so on a reverse geometry part, um, we have the contacts on the long edge of the part, and you can see that with the picture. Uh, there's one edge of the one termination, there's the other. We suddenly take that same 0805 XY area, that same board area, and we drop the inductance to 130 picohenry. So imagine the impact on resonant frequency there. We want that resonant frequency as high as possible, right? Um, well, let's look at another way to drop part, and that's with something called an interdigitated cap. This looks like a cap array, but it is not. You can see this red corresponds to the electrode and one electrode to have a, a connection to this terminal, to this terminal, to this terminal, and then to this terminal. And then that blue 
electrode would have a connection to all the others. So it's still a single capacitor. If you're looking and trying to uh, retrofit and 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 uh, determine if it's a cap array, it looks just like a cap array, but it's it's not. Um, but at any rate, you can get that to 44 picohenries for that same OIDL5, same cap. That's a big deal. Now, there's another thing. If we take those electrodes and orient them to be vertical to the printed circuit board, printed circuit boards down here, this electrode or this termination corresponds to the blue electrode. This pink or red one corresponds to this. We could drop inductance down to 15 picohenries. So that same 105 package, we could drop the inductance by a very, very sizable amount. And that pushes our resonant frequency out. It's a good thing for decoupling. Now, there's even more trends in the world of, of decoupling. And might I add, there's some bulk trends for low inductance decoupling that are occurring. Uh, generally speaking, tantalums have so many different case sizes, we could very accurately predict their, um, their inductance. And since they're small, we could disperse tantalums around the board as stable bulk capacitors. Well, let me get back to this ceramic world. I'm sorry I got off topic for a second, but I didn't mean to imply that low inductance only uh, corresponds to ceramics. It, it could correspond to any, any part out there. Um, but the one I think of first is ceramics. And now here's a three terminal part. This happens to be an 0402. And this is interesting. It's a 15 microfarad 0402. It's great for core voltage. Uh, decoupling and filtering. And you could see that um, the impedance and the resonant point, here's the impedance ESR, uh, the ESR in, in, um, in red, and the impedance curve in this blue here. And you could see that this 15 microfarads has a resonant frequency of about 10 megahertz, which is really amazing. Since we already talked about bias effects, I thought we'd put this in here and talk about it. Um, with zero zero bias and with with bias, mm -hmm. that's the that's what we have to be concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, that's our temperature bias effects, and here's the AC and the AC and the DC bias effects. And then another thing that's really important is the concept of ultra broadband components. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at that three terminal capacitor in a few slides before here. We saw, we saw a very pronounced impedance curve. It looked like a V. Well, if we look at the S21, the four transmission loss on something called an ultra broadband capacitor, we could show the transmission loss, that insertion loss from a low frequency of 7.2 kilohertz up to 110 gigahertz. So it's a massive broadband component. Now I just picked out one that was a 40 gig. Uh, bandwidth that that's pretty big you know i mean it's not our 110 but okay it's still zero to 40 or 16 to 40 gigs 16 kilohertz to 40 gigs is still a big deal right so yes so this would be the kind of capacitors you would like to use uh, when you are designing rf circuits yes it could be it could be for ac coupling it could be for dc uh, blocking, but you know, you might use these on a 30s or maybe optic drivers or you know, laser optics, things like that. Um, and it's important to really optimize and provide a constant impedance as much as possible across that spectrum. Uh, what else is interesting about these uh, ceramic capacitors are, are important, not only interesting, also important? Well, let me just kind of go through it. You know, that that's pretty much it. Um, the, the stability and the physical examples and the downsizing trend. And perhaps the next thing is to talk about is stacks, right? Okay. And, and it's bulk capacitors. What can we do? The, the next topic that's of importance to designers really is what do we do for bulk capacitors? Now we've got the ability to put these broadband, low loss, high cap, super small ceramics around the processor, underneath the processor. In the RF world, we put them inside. And by the way, uh, we can now, manufacturers can now build components that could be embedded in the printed circuit board itself. So that's our small signal stuff. What's going on in the world of high signal or high power? 
and that's a real difficulty as you would imagine with now fpgas and, and gpus having so much high power what do we do for the power trees and now the importance is coming that uh, the inductance of these of these bulk capacitors and the ability to put stable high frequency bulk capacitors around the board is is a big deal so the thought of of stacking these vertically or horizontally, horizontal cases shown here, that's a big deal. Now, I don't mean to downplay the role of tantalums. And in fact, in this material, I didn't even include tantalums because this is part of a course that I teach uh, that another professor talked about uh, the, the, the tantalum devices. Mm -hmm. Love to talk about tantalums at another point. But these stack capacitors, they're great to increase the efficiency of a power supply, make it a switcher. Switchers are going to be a smaller weight and size and all of that, maybe efficiency. So what we're doing is we could essentially replace this electrolytic with either horizontal or with that vertical stack capacitor, and we'll gain some great electrical characteristics. And those electrical characteristics um, well, we'll talk about those. You get some some pretty good comparison of, of stacked and, and radial electrolytics here. But here's the deal. In the case of the stacked uh, ceramic versus that of the electrolytic, we have some, some good things going on. Um, the electrolytic itself is, is not terribly stable with temperature. Well, in X5R, this is the absolute worst case of the of the uh, class two, we'll see that that cap will be down. But generally speaking, it, it's it's manageable with knowledge. Um, the thing that's interesting, though, let's say we're we're dealing a switcher at low temperature as well. The the ceramic is going to be very stable, and the electrolytic starts having some some issues mm -hmm. there. So that's a big deal. If we look at the standard or one standard frequency response on a ceramic cap that's stacked you could see the the same type of of thing you've got your uh, low esr relatively low across the spectrum and then you've got a uh, an impedance characteristic now electrically what happens well that electrically translates into if we look at the esr of an electrolytic versus that of even a tantalum or or some other types of electrolytics uh, and then start showing that of, of the ceramics, dramatically lower ESR. Now, these are so reliable as well. Um, I mean, everyone's familiar with the electrolytic uh, characteristic where the, the dielectric might dry out with time and the capacitor goes bad. Um, so that is not a, it's just the, the way electrolytics are, right? We have a hybrid electrolytic, we could have a polymer electrolytic, we improve the lifetime of those parts. In fact, that's something that we offer as well. But electrolytics inherently can, can dry out and they could fail. Well, the ceramics are not only better electrically, they have a, a, a series of high rel, uh, as well as, as commercial and consumer and even automotive grades. So ceramics now that are stacked are making their way into the world of, of those power supplies. And that's really a, a big deal. You could actually see the, you know, why do we have a lower inductance? Well, we have, in this case, we're showing a, a vertical oriented electrode system. Uh, we're having to show something that goes through printed, you know, circuit board holes. So it's a, a through hole part. There's J and L leads around, but um, compared to the electrolytic, which is, is wound uh, you could understand why there's some pretty sizable electrical advantages on that on that type of of component. What about price? You know, I, I don't know pricing that well. I'm sure it's more expensive, but I okay. don't know how much more expensive. Okay. And I think the other thing is, in terms of efficiency, uh, we could run these things up at dramatically higher frequencies. That would affect our, our overall, the inductor size, maybe the power quality, the weight, the box, et cetera. So I, I'm not trying to give you an accountant answer, but boy, there's a lot of considerations that this could just take off the table. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to go back to 
slide 41. Okay. Yeah, yeah this one. Uh, I just wanted to be sure I understand. So from this, it looks like uh, this electrolytic is more stable with DC bias and temperature. <coughs> yes, actually it is. It's more stable. Now, that's not necessarily a, a oh, bad thing at all, right? It's a good I'm sorry. thing. Can you close the designer because it will move uh, the it, it moved the left size of the left column and okay how do I how the, do I do that that is just X X down ah, go sorry. down yeah okay perfect we can continue okay, okay yeah so you can continue from yes it is yeah is this okay yeah yeah okay got it so yeah so here um you know the electrolytics it's solid with its bias and that's characteristic of electrolytics tantalums as well no no bias effects that's a real good thing uh but in the world of of stability with low temperatures which there's probably an awful lot of temperature variance across every design that's where the electrolytics start showing some real problems and the stack capacitors they actually initiated their designs with um that of of uh, avionics so um, when we start talking about the amount of weight that we could reduce, it's just incredibly important to the end system. And now I think we just look at the difference that you could get with with enabling a, a DC to DC converter versus a linear um, supply, right? I mean, the amount of efficiency that we could gain in terms of grid loading and, and uh, overall of power uh, utilization I think there's a lot to be said about about the switchers and about these um, lower loss ceramics. Of course, that'll be associated with uh, probably three, five components actives, right? With the faster transition times and such. Okay. Now I have a question. We talk a lot about uh, these uh, ceramic capacitors, but I, I know there are different kinds of capacitors. So why we would like to use different capacitors? Yes. Well, from a, a different component point of view, um, you're, you're saying, why would we want to use the, different uh, kind of not ceramic capacitors, but something else? Oh, yeah. OK, sure. Well, in the world of, of maybe we want something that's going to be uh, failing safe. Um, so that would be an opportunity for films where these devices, like in the world of, of um, windmill power generation or DC well, any of the drives, not necessarily even only DC, we want, might want components that have the ability to uh, to self-heal. And that's actually another trend that's getting a little bit bigger in the world of of passives is self-healing parts. Um, I never I heard about in, this. Okay. Yeah, I could jump into the, the world of, of films here. And um, films are actually a pretty neat part. Um, many people think of film capacitors only as that of those associated with uh, audio because they have no piezoelectric noise, they've got, got good distortion characteristics. Well, that's, that's true, but there's other things that they're good for. Here's how you, here's how you build a film. You take a, you take a very specialized uh, piece of plastic that, that we'll talk about the dielectric. You metalize it. That gives you your electrode. So it's a small thickness of electrode. Now imagine you have this, um, this plastic, what's been metalized, we, we cut it to a certain width, and then it could be rolled into uh, some structure. Now, this actually is the electrode uh, system and you're, you're, you've got your very thin dielectric. And the thing is though, that, that film thickness, oh, it might be a half a micron, it might be maybe 10, maybe 20 but it's very small, small mm -hmm. dimensions. And it's because of that, that such a thin metallization, if there was a failure, it would get hot, it would vaporize, and essentially the particles would precipitate around the cooler metallization of that electrode, thereby eliminating the chance for a dead short. Mm -hmm. And that's a, an, an immensely important feature of this type of part. Imagine you've got 40 kilowatts or so in your in your 
power drive of your electric vehicle. The last thing you want is a, a capacitor in the drive to go dead short. So that's you know critical that it does not happen. So ceramic um, capacitors, the, when they fail, there is usually only the higher resistance and that's it? Or they also can fail into short circuit? Yeah, ceramics are going to fail into a short. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so films have that that impossibility. Well, I suppose it's not impossible if you if you drove over them with the bulldozer and put both of the terminals together. But um, in addition to that thin dielectric, and the thin metal that's on the thin dielectric that precipitates it around a failure site. There's other designs which are fused designs. And this is a blow up of the, of the area of the electrode. And within these segmentations, we could think of them as individual capacitors. Now, these individual capacitors are connected to other capacitors, and there's some, there's some ESR associated with that metal, and then there's that gate. Well, that's essentially the fuse, and that there's a small metallization between each of these pads, and should this particular sector die, mm -hmm. do, it, do it a dead short, well, those fuses would blow. And that would isolate this sector. Mm -hmm. So if we have a failed film capacitor, we actually classify a 5% drop in capacitance as a failed part. Now, it varies by manufacturer. It varies by your specific series and things like that. But it's it's not a dead short going away. But that's a much different uh, use scenario to uh, live with than, you know, 10 ohms on the output of 40 kilowatts, right? That, so, that's uh, interesting. so this would be used, for example, the electric cars? cars. Yeah, it could be, or it could be like on a windmill. Uh, there's some, you could package these in many different, and, and this is important. We could package them in many different configurations. That might be a cylindrical, it might be a bomb. And now that, and here's a better picture of that segmented uh, fuse. But we could then take the bobbins or the pucks and put them with CAD cam. We could worry about heat flow and optimize voltages and things like that. And we could actually give you sense wires if you want to sense temperatures, but we can make these into very specialized or very optimized modules that might be for your DC link and these power drives. So many different options to configure these specifically for RMS currents and mm -hmm. voltages for everything from windmills to electric buses to electric vehicles and EV trucks, uh, or even maybe the uh, compression pumps on, on pipelines. Um, so that's that's a, a good snapshot of the, the types of end modules that could be built with films. Now, the other thing is if we look at the lifetime of this, um, the film capacitors are essentially a function of the hot spot. Um, so I, I suppose another way to put this is you want to operate your films at a low temperature at a, a slightly de, de, uh, derated uh, voltage. And this would be the governing equation that really all film capacitor companies uh, talk about. We have to worry about our ambient temperature. Then we have to worry about, um, it, you know, the, the temperature rise from our I squared R that's occurring in that part. Um, I could show the outcome. This is maybe the best graph of the mission profile on a, on a film capacitor. Many times customers come to us and say, we have a automobile that's going to have of time at 101 degrees C and yeah, you know, they'll actually give us the amount of time that that this car sees these temperatures and they ask uh, they then ask us this this uh, this question of how much life impact occurs by this higher voltage at a at a 
relatively high temperature. And we could sum up all of the amount of uh, impacts upon the lifetime of the part. We can give them the lifetime expectancy of that component. Uh, so that is something that all manufacturers of films offer. Um, I believe we probably excel at it due to some some simulation advantages and material advantages, but but the point is that uh, it's it's a very different concern being on forty or hundred kilowatts of of power and having a short here, and uh, this is optimized and measured very regularly uh, in field with uh, NTCs that could be embedded in the parts or with standard QC means in the factories. Mm -hmm. What other kind of capacitors do you have here in these slides? Well, there's thin film capacitors. Um, thin film capacitors are kind of neat. We, we talked about film capacitors, but this is essentially a type of uh, component that's, that's built, maybe it's maybe built on alumina or it might be built on, on glass or some other things, but they're very low value. They're very low loss. They're commonly um, RF types of components. The, the neat thing about film capacitors, thin film capacitors, is that they led the way into the ability to make uh, components that have either land grid array terminations or ball grid array terminations, standard terminations, or or wire bond and, and some other type of wrap terminations. So thin films, <clears throat> if we look at the general trend of, of actives trying to go in a 3D package, um, these types of thin films have the ability to do high density um, general purpose periphery passive functions in a very miniaturized package. Um, here's a simple example of a of a capacitor that looks to be like a standard ceramic part. Mm -hmm. Well, it's on glass, but a single part, but you could build these miniature arrays. And um, the thing is they're, they're very tight in terms of their uh, temperature characteristics. They're basically class one with zero aging. Um, this we're showing resonant frequency, the SRF self-resonant frequency versus cap value cues. They're almost, Perhaps the best way to put it, they're as close to the ideal capacitor as you could get in terms of loss and characteristics, as you'd imagine, because they're essentially an SiO2 oxide on, on glass. But you can um, get only very low values, or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're really RF parts. Um, you might be able to get up to maybe 220 or, well, depending upon the case size and the volume. But probably a practical high capacitance limit would be 220 picofarads or so. Mm -hmm. By the way, though, you could get these to accuracies that are in the the tenths of a, a picofarad. So we're looking at maybe 100 femtofarads, all the way down to about 15 femtofarads. Uh, likewise, there are thin film inductors that have the same underlying advantages of, of tight tolerance, low loss, extreme stability. But there again, low inductance values, primarily RF in nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was on the next slide you wanted to talk about the next slide? Well, the, you know, the neat thing about these, sometimes we should look at the um, power rating of capacitors, and that happens to be a big question in the world of, of ceramics. What type of power can, can that package dissipate? So this is a good chart. It, uh, it gives a general comparison of ceramic types. Now we have to be careful at varies by manufacturer and dielectric and terminations and things, but uh, that shows that the films have a much higher uh, ability, a much higher wattage capability than than their uh, than their ceramic. So how would you calculate this? It would be like some kind of peak current and voltage flowing through the capacitor or what, what is? Yeah, we've got some good white papers on that. We're actually We'll look at the amount of heat that we could put into the part without having thermal runaway. So we might put a particular ripple voltage on the part and uh, keep increasing that or ripple current onto the part before we uh, get to the point of throwing it into a thermal runaway. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's, of course, this, this is very gen generic. It doesn't talk about the possibility of a heat plate on the component 
or some other optimized heat flow parameters that could occur. But from a general point of view, it's it's kind of neat because it it shows that in the world of of like a thin film versus a ceramic, usually you can get quite a bit more power out. Of course, I mean we might we're building on alumina, right? So that's a, a big portion of it itself, right? Okay, what is on the next slide? Um, well, these just talk about ah, okay. the simulation. So that's maybe a not of that much importance. I don't know. Okay, I think uh, you have five... also super caps. Yeah, or... super caps. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So super caps are kind of neat. There's a lot going on in the world of super capacitors now, right? And um, some of them, most simple ones, are these individual building blocks. You could think of a of a soda can having about three thousand farads of uh, capacitance at 2.7 volts or 3 volts. So it's low voltage, but a lot of cap, right? Now you could think of, of the other type of super cap is either having two or three of these in a small, already modularized package. Now there's no reason we can't put 30 of these into a small modularized package like this, other than size and demand. And you can see if we can get up to a nine volt uh, or maybe a six volt, five volt type rating, this is adequate for many applications. So um, in the world of super caps, uh, generally you're seeing that the individual parts are going up to a, a much higher uh, capacitance per unit volume. Um, super caps are almost, well, it's about the same uh, concern on the ceiling of a super cap as that of an electrolytic. So the super cap, from a mechanical point of view, this seal area is everything in the world of, of its performance. And there's a condition called wettability. And wettability is when the, the liquid material in, inside the cap starts to leak out and uh, destroy the printed circuit board around it. So that's why this is a very important characteristic uh, and uh, consideration when you're selecting your super cap. Mm -hmm. So um, this was this wasn't the question what I was just writing down, like yeah. why we wouldn't use super caps everywhere because you know capacitance is important. So there are some yeah. disadvantages of super caps. Yeah, there is. I mean, well, yes, from a temperature point of view, we have to be concerned about about the temperature, right? We, since it's essentially a liquid material system, we we can't be going over, you know, boiling and, and we have to be careful on the low end. Uh, but then also the frequency response, it's not going to have the kind of frequency responses as a ceramic relative to a battery though. Now that's where we get the, the it, it's not a battery, right? But that's where we're starting to see some really neat characteristics here. Um, and believe me, this by no means is what's in the lab. Um, I think all super cap people are being a little bit protective of of the highest of the end products, but the stuff going out in the day, oh well, first off, it could take millions of, of charge discharges. You know, LiPos might have a thousand cycles. So that's huge advantage for us there. Then specific power is outstanding. This, this we have such an ability to take uh, and dump current out of these things. I've seen miniature capacitors uh, the size of uh, maybe four or five cigarette packs put together, uh, start a vehicle. So that's that's a big thing. The amount of current we could dump out of these things is is incredible. Cost per watt hour that's dropping. I, I and I guarantee you that the number we agree on what it is today, it'll already be wrong for tomorrow. These are getting much more competitive. The volumes are are it's just in the takeoff mode. You know, if uh, if we could kind of classify it that way. Uh, by the way, they're used quite frequently throughout vehicles and EVs, but even conventional internal combustion engines, uh, it might be something as simple as on the dash display. It might be in the emergency call circuit or in the, the self-closing latches uh, for minivans, and the trunks and things like that, where we have to activate a motor. We need that high amount of burst current. Uh, that's what super caps can really do. That could give, they could give us that massive DIDT. Um, that's tremendously needed. That's what uh, I was thinking it. about. Yeah. So they can uh, be very helpful if you need high currents for a very short time. 
Yes, that's absolutely true. And the other yep. example is if you need very low current and uh, you would you and the circuit is not connected to battery or anything and you would like to keep it live for a couple of seconds or maybe minutes, then another case. Yeah, dying gasp. Okay. Yeah, dying gasp is a really good thing. Now the, the certainly in everything other than solid state drives, well, I would say in most things other than solid state drives, these excel. In the world of solid state drives, we've got that height limitation. And and in, of course, that's also in maybe other critical applications, we have a, a leakage consideration. That's where tantalums really excel there. So it's interesting you mentioned the holdup because tantalums now are so low leakage, they have an increased voltage and they have a miniaturized size, they suddenly are becoming the component of choice for hold up around some of the uh, other advanced circuits. But mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely true. In the generic world, these guys are the, the way to go. And, 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 you know, okay, we might cut out in the, in the world of maybe 90 degrees centigrade, but hey, batteries aren't going to do that well up to 90C or 85C. It's all a function of, of uh, there's a great reliability curve, and mm -hmm. it says that uh, for every 10 degrees C, you derate this thing, you double the life. And for every 0.1 volt that you derate the super cap, you double the life. So it's an easy enough equation or, or graph to deal with. And uh, super caps are suddenly very practical. In fact, we've done, and we're doing a paper at PCNS that talks about powering IoT nodes exclusively with supercapacitors and tantalums in conjunction. The tantalum is the wake up cap, the super cap is the battery equivalent. Uh, when the super cap is discharged, it goes into the, the microcontroller goes into a shutdown mode and then we'll go back and, and uh, um, get into a sleep mode. The super cap is charging while the uh, tantalum essentially is the uh, the low current standby maintenance cap and, and it's a infinite loop. Oh, it's, that's it's interesting. Really... I didn't know there are circuits like this. So yeah, you have something they're... what can uh, deliver power for, what can deliver a lot of power, but only with limited current. And then you, you use this super cap to charge with this limited current for a very long yes. time. You use super cap to power up uh, your circuit for a couple of seconds, do the measurements or something what you need. And then it shuts down. And again, you take power from this. Uh, yes. Uh, how did you call it? Uh, well, the, it's it's an energy harvester controller that's actually within a portion of an MCU. Uh, so there's some MC, my, you know, MCUs that have that function. And then there's also a variety of, of PEMEX that are doing about the same thing. Of course, you need the extra IC on board, but but uh, yeah, the, this, the super capacitor is your battery equivalent and the tantalum capacitor is your startup. Mm -hmm. So in standby, ultra low current mode, the tantalum being smaller and, and much lower leakage and such, it's easy to charge up quickly and it's, it's pretty much always charged uh, and ready to go while the supercapacitor is chugging along and doing the processing and then it, it falls off, its voltage is too low. And then we'll go back to uh, a shutdown with the, with mm -hmm. the tablet yeah, controlling true. things. So yeah. energy harvesting devices. So it's something, it can be even like solar power or something. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we, we did a solar power one. Um, we were going to do Piazza electric, but time didn't, uh, it didn't there was no time available to do it but mm -hmm. uh, yeah there's some great i see uh notes on that that are out there and um find that i find that very interesting particularly in iot where we might have 30 billion nodes uh, of iot out there in i don't know maybe five years or or so it, it's it's a big number if it's not 30 billion maybe it's 29 maybe it's 32 who knows but um iot is going to do nothing but go up right so now think of getting rid of so many of those batteries and the maintenance costs and, and the potential to damage an IoT node when you're replacing the battery. It's it's a real good upside for, mm -hmm. for super capacitors. So basically you would have, for example, a solar panel, you would charge super cap because solar panel will not deliver very high current. So you right. just charge super cap you would run your circuit to do measurements or send data or something. Uh, 
you would spend almost all the energy from the supercar, but that's not the problem because it would charge again from the solar panel and then it would right. make the measurement again, I don't know, in a couple of minutes or one hour or something. Okay. That's okay, right. Totally sorry. depend upon duty cycle and the current rating, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of opportunity, I think. So this was also interesting for me. So super caps, uh, they are built differently. So they use this uh, electrolyte inside. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and and really, it's it's a function of what's the area of the uh, of the material system. Now, interestingly enough, there's uh, another type of supercapacitor with a different package. Um, we're, we're showing, the prior slide showed the super caps that look like an aluminum electrolytic, right? Well, there are super caps that actually look like a business card. In fact, they, I think the minimum thickness is 1.5 millimeters. I, I'd have to go back and look at the specs, but it's, a, it's incredibly thin. And uh, so those are uh, a, a different, slightly different material system, but uh, foil package, it's, it's quite impressive to look at the prismatic cell supercapacitor and what it could do in, in board. Mm -hmm. So that would be different kind of supercap. Yeah, different kind. But same same deal, right? We're going to have, I believe, the uh, the one that's like two, two millimeters thick. Boy, I want to say it was 20 farads or so. It was a significant amount of capacitance. And, uh, you know, that's quite easy to potentially put inside of a an open area on a, on a on a board it's it's really interesting what we could do there there's a lot i've found so much of the supercapacitor designs are a very large percentage are basically determined by the physical characteristics of fitting the part into your circuit mm -hmm. um, and the electrical characteristics are they're easy it's just that we're not normally used to dealing with 10 or 100 farads that are at our, at our uh, you know, easy to, to draw upon. Um, yeah, I have another question. How long does it take to discharge the super cap if it's not connected to any circuit? Yeah, there's some pretty good discharge curves that are available. I should have put one in here. I could, I could send you one. Uh, but they're not they're not going to hold power up forever so they're going to be um you know you're going to have you're going to have power loss and i could show you the the leakage current it's not in the amps or hundreds of milliamps by any means but uh um yeah these aren't these aren't like the uh, i don't know like a a, a low loss part in, in one respect right mm -hmm. okay what else you have here what uh, other kind of capacitors I, I think that's it. The The failure I have is I didn't talk about tantalums, and I'm sorry about that. The, you see, tantalums have gotten so advanced and so uh, so many case sizes, so many new material systems, that that's actually a separate um, course that we teach. Um, sorry I didn't bring it in here. We could. I'd be happy to it if you'd ever want us back, but um, I just didn't put it in there. But we can talk a little bit about them. So what would you say sure. about the tantalum well, capacitors? In the world of tantalums, a lot of really neat things are going on. Number one, there's a, a lot of different case sizes. And that's important uh, because imagine having a an equivalent of 100 microfarads or so, in a, I don't know, maybe an 0603 that, or an 0805 that, that doesn't have aging. It doesn't have DC bias effects, no AC bias effects. Um, no, no, no effects like that at all. So tantalum itself and the fact that there's high cap in, in small packages is finding a great utilization as the bulk capacitor in miniaturized systems and system on chips. And it's expanding from there, but um, that's really critical. Now, the other thing is in terms of the ESR on tantalums, that's dropping. And it's dropping because of the tantalum polymer trend. Certainly traditional tantalums aren't going to go away, but the polymer offers that added importance of, of uh, low, low uh, ESR. And that, of course, translates into a higher RMS current. And you'll find that even the military 
And the space agencies are now um, accepting that and creating specifications for space flight tantalum polymer parts. It's interesting because the bathtub curve on tantalum and on tantalum polymers, uh, the, the failure curve that shows infant mortality, once those are taken out, you have an incredibly long uh, amount of lifetime with tantalum, much more so than any other material system. Mm -hmm. So if we talked about the we talked about the ideal capacitor in the high frequency sense being the silicon, the SiO2, the thin film capacitor, right? Well, the ideal bulk capacitor is that of the tantalums mm -hmm. and their stability and their reliability. And now their miniaturized case size and optimized electrical characteristics, they just make them active component to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are more expensive than than sure. standard uh, ceramic capacitors. Yeah, they, they are. I, I don't really know pricing. I know that it's uh, it's getting better, but mm -hmm. I just don't know pricing. I I see them more used. Oh, my internet is going. Can you hear me okay, Robert? Yes, I can hear you. Sometimes okay. you, you drop, but uh, it was always okay. Okay, got it. Well, yes, from a, a pricing point of view, though, I think that that tantalums are, are competitive, but I just don't deal with the, the numbers every day. We're, we're working with building the best systems out there. And in fact, you know, in, in a, some sense, the price is almost irrelevant when we're dealing with uh, FPGAs that might yeah. be $800 or so, right? So in the cases where we really need to pu push the technology, tantalum is just critical, absolutely critical. So when we are talking about ESR, when we would like to use capacitors with low ESR and when low ESR is not so important. Yeah, really power conversion is going to be the one that, that hits us, you know, from the, the low ESR point of view. Um, and from an RF point of view, okay, we want to have low loss caps out there as well. But pretty much everything else is, is you know, acceptable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty much acceptable. Uh, low inductance is, is going to be the, the big buzzword more than ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's critical. That, and so please be aware of the reduced case sizes in the world of ceramics that are out there, but also the, the new configurations, the, the reverse geometry parts, bland grid array parts, the interdigitated parts. And there's other things that are coming out beyond that that uh, we would love to talk about. I'm sure that uh, the designers uh, that we work with are are enjoying some of the advantages of the parts we're offering, uh, including embedded parts. That's going to be a big thing. I would like to make I video believe... about this. Embedded What's that? Parts. Embedded parts in PCBs. I would like to make a video about this. Well, boy, you know, now there's embedded RF capacitors in addition to embedded general purpose capacitors. <laughs> and that's a great idea. I think, you know, what would be a great um, series might be, or a great video would be that of the effect of the ship act where we're doing 3d ic packaging and 2.5 and 3d packaging and the need for passive components and uh, now there's even a we took the the we made that ultra broadband resistor right but we made that also into a miniature heat pipe and uh, there's a lot of new components that are actually coming about as a result of uh, experiments with optimizing traditional parts. So we were building a, uh, a certain type of, of resistor and we discovered a, a way to optimize the interface, the metal interface to the uh, substrate <clears throat> where we could suddenly have a an equivalent of a surface mount heat pipe. Um, and now it's not as electrically, it's, it's an insulator, but thermally it's a conductor. So it's not as big as a heat pipe, but the fact that you could place this small passive chip as small as an O302, it could be smaller as well. No one's asked for it to be smaller, but um, the fact that you could have heat extraction on active pins is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we get into higher speed GPUs and AI and all of that and 3D packages, um, there's gonna be a real, future for things like that. Okay. 
Can you can we can we go very quickly through all the other slides? I just would like to know if we didn't forget something sure. important. I I think uh, is it okay to go backwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Okay. You can go at the beginning and let's have a look also. All right. We'll do right from the beginning here and, and just Yeah. So uh yeah, maybe that's the one to to, to end with, right? <laughs> but uh uh, okay, so this covered. That's okay. We, we uh, okay, just... go go back. I would like to see all the kind of capacitor. So, uh, is there something super weird what we would like to mention? Uh, maybe no. I know all of them. Well, a lot's happened in the last you know couple hundred years, <laughs> and um, you know I I think the rate of changes is going to be dramatic for us though now. As we said, we're coming up with, well, I can't give you the exact number because it's probably proprietary, but the amount of new products is accelerating, as you'd imagine. Um, so and then this is all... Okay, what is this? Oh, show the graph. The so graph, this is where we that's... would like to use, okay, specific... This is this is nice one. Yeah, and that, comes, that came from EPCI, uh, uh, European Passive Component Institute, Dr. Zendicek. And this is great because... What this graph shows you is the common voltage rating on the y-axis, the capacitance on the x-axis, the technology is the different colors, and then it kind of shows the, the region at which you're going to start worrying about power and energy harvesting. Uh, energy harvesting, remember when we talked about those those means where you could have an IoT and suddenly you no longer have to worry about a battery for that IoT module because of the ultra low power uh, microcontrollers and such. And then in the world of coupling and, and uh, high frequency decoupling, well, that's you know that's usually going to be in the in the up to a microfarad region. The thing that's impacting that that is going to the right. And now I believe we can give you 15 microfarad, 15 pico Henry inductance capacitors. That's quite attractive in the world of hey, GPUs and system on chips, FPGAs, et cetera, right? So this graph changes with time. And it really would like to compliment EPCI, European Pest Components Institute. We're not associated with them, but they have a very, uh, very good overview of all passives. And mm -hmm. uh, this came from them. We modified it slightly. It is nice. Okay, yeah. what is the next one? Uh, okay, this shows some of the yeah. you know different packages. We went through these. Um, that's just how we divide you know buildings, the um, flexibility, the downsizing trend, the stack caps. <laughs> we really went through many of these. We yeah, we did great. We hit them, and it, uh, I hope it wasn't too long. And I hope no, things worked no. out. How you I, I'm surprised. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> we went through all these. Yeah, you know, it's a great. It, we did good. So, hey, I I really appreciate the chance to get on, Robert. Your your material is outstanding. Um, I have uh, forwarded your site to um, a couple of the managers I know at a, at a major automotive company. Um, your site is uh, being used to help bring some new engineers on board and, and I think it's it's gonna well you already have a big audience but I I felt that the people that that I I know specifically up there uh in particular voltage bias effects should pay more attention to your channel and uh really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very That's much Ron. I, I I really appreciate you found time for this oh, call no and and I really hope this will be useful for engineers to decide uh, or at least understand better uh, what are differences between different materials or different uh, this X5R or something else and as you say DC bias I think these are all important information which can be very useful if you know how to use this. Well, oh, that's the truth. It really is. Oh, thank you very much, Ron. And uh, oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I, hey, I really hope you this... enjoyed this because I really like you know, talking about all these things. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. And and please, if you if you are able to tell me when you get it on the web, that would be that would be great. Yeah, I will let so, you know. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye. Yeah.
Take no, care, bye now. Don't don't switch, don't switch, don't switch off. Uh, it, this was just finished oh. the video. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's everything. Thank you very much for watching this video. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our FedEvel online courses, where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye!